if you can do what's in today's class, you will be able to conquer multi-beam data at the lowest level, and you can take over the world. Mm -hmm. Or at least read Rezon and Simrad Kongsberg multi-beam data. The, the copy command in Emacs is meta w. Yes. And it never seems to work for me. Yeah, so I've been trying to figure out uh, how exactly it's designed to work. So it works within Emacs, but it's not copying to the clipboard. So when we go, like, if, you'll see me, like if you go back in some of the old lectures, well, you'll hear me trying to yeah, paste, so it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, so it's control Y. So meta Y, once you've pasted, if you don't do anything else and you hit meta Y, it rolls back through your previous clipboard entries. Oh, okay. So it's the same as paste from kill menu. You go back through these different mm -hmm. items and paste them in. This paste the last one. Let's go ahead and get started with lecture 21. So make sure that you have gone through the make directory dash p for multiple directories tilde slash class slash 21 cd into that directory and to double check you can do a pwd to see where you're at and then you can do a wget of this file since you want to be copying and pasting a little bit out of it today and if you want to get at that an easy way to get that url is either from the irc channel or you can right click on the org file and copy link location and paste it in we're going to talk about parsing binary data i picked a sample file thanks to glenn rice who suggested using sbets, which is a format that I have to look at the definition of. It's a smooth best estimate of trajectory from the Aplanix pause pack inertial navigation system. And the nice thing about the sbet format is that it's very uniform and simple. It's not a great example in terms of complexity, but when we start off, we don't really want to jump into the multi-beam formats like the Rezon or the simrad Connorsberg formats, which have all kinds of different data structures and lots of different groups of data, and it was really much more complex to parse. But if you get the basics of the next class or two as we work through parsing binary data, this will give you the tools that you can go and work on those file formats and be able to parse them and, and read them on your own. And while that's not useful in terms of processing big survey data, you're going to want to use a package like MB system or HiPack or Keras to read through those and really do your full processing. When things go wrong or you want to build tools that handle what you want out of these data sets, if you need to build, say, summary reports that are automatically generated, dig into bugs and questions about how things are actually working, being able to parse that binary data is super powerful and it changes your view of how multi-beam and other data systems work when you can actually get in there and see what the vendor's really doing. That'll give you the tools that when you're stuck out there, something goes wrong or it's different than you expect, you might be able to figure it out. Jonathan Bedouin, who's here, also teaches a multi-beam parsing class. He's taught it once so far. Hopefully, if you understand this stuff, when you go in to work with him, you'll have a better chance of focusing more on the multi-beam and less on the mechanics of writing code to parse that binary data. Because if you're trying to learn programming as you work with multi-beam data, it's going to be a bit challenging. Yeah, it's definitely doable, but it's just extra work. So being able to focus more on the complexities of a Simrad Connorsberg data format uh, is plenty of work on its own. So let me show you a quick tour of the format we're going to be getting into so that you've seen it at least once. I've got a link in here to the full pause pack quick start guide if you want to read more about it. You can do that on your own if you get interested in it. But I've given you a table up there in the notes and I've just written it up here since. And this format consists of 17 parameters per message that comes back from the system. And they're all doubles. If we think about that, we'll talk a little bit more about data types here, but they're all the same type, which makes it life a little bit easier for us in terms of how the data is stored. And we've got time when that message was generated. We've got latitude and longitude, our altitude, our velocities, roll pitch heading, our accelerations in X, Y, and Z, and our angular accelerations in X, Y, and Z. We're gonna focus just on these top guys up here, our time, latitude, longitude, and altitude, but we need to be able to skip past all of those guys and read a bunch of records. And in the file with an SBET, Basically what, what you're going to see in terms of the data file, if this is position zero, each record, so position 17, 
This will start the, this is the first record, second record, and so forth. If you can read through each of these blocks, each one of these contains this data as a bunch of bytes. These are eight bytes each, and so it's eight times 17 bytes long for each one of these groups. So we'll be reading chunks of those as we go along. It, then you'll be able to parse the parts out of those that you want and be able to return a ship track that shows where the ship's going and when the ship was at that particular location. And we'll be using uh, the NOAA Fairweather ship. The pause pack software returns a very high rate. I'm not sure how many hertz it is, but it was basically many millions of records. I've decimated that down to just a few. So I think we have like 100 records in our sample file. And that makes it a lot easier to work with because the original files, when you get them, are several hundred megabytes or more. And here we're gonna be working with about a 20K bytes file size. I've just taken every N records. I took this record, skipped a whole bunch, and then grabbed another one down the ways and pasted that into a file, not pasting and pasting, but actually using code to do it, to just write those records in and build you something that shows the whole ship track, but decimated down to just a few points. So let's jump into some binary data. Just above that table, I have a command to use curl to grab that data file. So I'm going to paste that in. Uh, there is some uh, checksum too. The checksum, there is no checksumming anywhere in the file. That's the checksum that I ran. So this file has no information about how many records there are or any validation of them. It could be corrupted, and the only way you might guess that is if you had an outside checksum or if it didn't line, if you had you got to the end and you had a half record or something like that would mean that maybe some data got junked or something like that. This is not the most robust format on the planet. You don't want to send this over an unreliable network connection because you're going to have troubles. Copy, paste. And before I forget, I'm taking this class as pieces out of something I wrote up last year in preparation for this. So I put a link up here under C also. I printed out at 30 pages. Uh, lots of detail with paragraphs describing things. It's not fully baked. There's definitely some work that needs to get done to turn this into polished text. But for this class, there's a lot more information and background at that link than what we'll see here. It'll describe everything in, well not everything, but most of it in good detail and give you uh, a lot more background reading. So hopefully that'll help with this a little bit more difficult topic. So now that we've got the file, so it starts off with 22K. I need to B unzip it sample.sbet, and let's see how big we have it. So the compression here, by being a, such a tiny file, it went from 22473 to 22712. So me compressing this file didn't really help us too much here, but it's so small it doesn't really matter. And let's take a quick peek into the data. Before we get into Python, we'll try some other tools to look at this. So the first one that I love doing, I'm going to type clear just to hide stuff, is I always run file on things. So if we say file star.sbet, it comes back with a very informative data. Not very exciting. We need to move on. The next thing we can do is a command called od or octal dump. Man od. So it dumps files in octal format. Base 10 is our normal number scheme. Base 8 is octal, base 16 is hex. If you start doing a lot of stuff with computers, you'll end up seeing these a fair bit. I don't expect you to read octal or hex too much in this class, or even really understand, but we've done a little bit of octal and a little bit of hex. You haven't really probably noticed that we're doing it, but this command will help dump stuff, and we can see what the binary might look like. So we can do edit copy. I'm gonna paste in our od-a sample.sbet, pipe that to head, hit enter, and we have nothing that looks terribly helpful. We can do a less on this file, sample.sbet, hit enter. It says this may be binary. Sure, why not? We'll take a look. And unlike some of our other formats, we got lucky there was some text hiding in there. If we look here, this is all binary data. There's nothing in here that gives us a whole lot of hints to stuff. This is just to show you that don't be afraid of looking at binary data. If you don't understand it, oh well, you know, we don't get this. It doesn't make sense to a human just staring at this screen, but you give it a go and see what happens. So hit Q to get out of less. This is sort of how it works when I look at new data files that I'm not used to. I get a lot of stuff with poor or no documentation, or I don't even know what the format type is, just here's a file with some data in it. 
These are the strategies I tend to use when looking at data. And you just keep trying them until you get something that starts making sense. We can try a different OD. Now with octal dump, it's actually possible to specify the type in there. And since we know these are doubles, we can tell it that we've got a bunch of doubles and maybe give it a shot and see what happens. And I'm gonna give you a simpler file that I know what, what's in there. I just wrote a file that's binary of the same format that just has the numbers one through, I think 16 or 17. So you can grab this wget command to grab a little sample file off the web server. And I just called it s1.bin. It's not really any particular thing. So if we say file s1.bin, we again get data, s1.bin, we do an ls of it, and we see that it's just a little tiny 136 byte file. And let's try our octal dump, and we'll say dash t for type, a floating point, and double. You have to read the man page if you want to see how to specify all this stuff, and give it a shot, s1.bin. If we hit enter, unfortunately this notation isn't the most fun, but this is your power of 10 exponent. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way down to, now it starts saying plus 1 down here. So this is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this shows that we can look at binary data with some tools. They're not necessarily the most fun. If you want to work with data, this tool is mostly just an inspection thing to sort of give a look into data. If you don't see anything here that makes a lot of sense, then you just move on and you don't worry about it. But sometimes this will give you insight into what you're looking at. At that point, I think it's time to move on to Python because it's much more interesting to look at data inside of Python. The command line tools aren't so much fun. IPython. And remember the log start from last time? Might as well go ahead and do a log start so that we've logged everything in there. So I'm going to do log start dash o dash r log dash class dash 21 dot pi. I'm leaving out the dash t this time. The timestamps, it was worth trying. Uh, if you think you need timestamps for what you're working on, say you're actually working with a real time system talking to a live sonar, timestamps might be really important when you go back and look at your notes. Here they're just generating extra noise. So hit enter. And if you want to see what's in your log to make sure it's working, bang, head, log, and I mistyped class. Well, I'll just leave it. So hopefully you can type class correctly and I'll just say bang, head, log, and you'll see that your log's starting to be written. Let's go and import the modules we're gonna to use today. So we'll say import struct. Struct is the Python module that reads binary data of all sorts of different types. Import numpy. NumPy is a great way of working with data in terms of big arrays. Some data formats that we'll work with can work in NumPy and some can't. The struct one is so simple and it's so uniform that creating an array of this is not a bad idea, so we can, we can try to do that. And I've got a link here. We're gonna start off looking at struct. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this link, bring up Firefox here with some documentation. In here, this table, is a table of character codes that you can use to tell Python what type of data you've got. Now, some of you may not have ever worked with this level of data in terms of sort of a more computer science-y view of what's behind the scenes. But when you're dealing with binary data, you're dealing with bits and bytes. When you have a chunk of memory in your computer, if you've got eight bytes, which is sort of the typical size of data, is anywhere between one byte and eight bytes. So if you have a character, Every one of these guys is going to represent one character, and that will be your C up there on the left on the format codes. Then you can have this be a one byte number, which can go from 0 to 255 if it's unsigned. It doesn't have a plus or minus. If it's signed, it goes from minus 127 to plus 127 or 26. And then you can start having various sizes that go and cover either 2 or 4 or 8 bytes on memory. So in order to have a double floating point number, it's going to use all eight of those bytes. A regular floating point number would use four. The more bytes you get, the more range of numbers you can represent. With this, you can specify what kind you have. And it takes a little bit of while to get used to working with numbers on this level. I just want you to see this table so that you know it's there in case you start working with data down the road that's got lots of different types. If you work with a SIMRAD, Congressburg format, for example, you end up using 
about half of those character codes up there when you try to read the different types of data. Like they have a clock packet, and then they've got uh, midwater column data and CTD cast and all kinds of stuff like that. It's all stored differently, and you'll need to use those codes. We are, however, we're going to live in a simpler world today with D for double, and that'll be our floating point eight byte number. You may run into terms like endianness, which means computers can represent things with different orders of those bytes. For today, don't worry about endianness. It's all going to be the same, so we don't have to worry about that. In the long run, you can get bit pretty badly by whether your data is big or little endian and the, where it was written and where you're reading it. But for today, we're working with the same data, the same endianness on the computer here and where it was written, so we can just not worry about that but you've at least now heard the term and you could go spend a couple hours Googling and reading up on endianness and still probably be a little confused. So I have a bunch of examples in here of writing out data and I don't want you to worry too much about this, but just copy this block, edit, copy. This is not the best way to write Python, but it's really compact. If we just paste those in there, it's gonna write a whole bunch of files. It really didn't like me. I did not import math. I had one where I, I wrote out the number pi. So if you see an error, I hadn't done import math pi to get pi out of there. And what I've done here is write a bunch of files. So if we can do ls-l, we now have a bunch of small sample files with dot bin on the end of various different sorts. And I've used the letter code, the lowercase b, capital B, and whatnot, to basically give you a hint as to the letter code that struct uses for what's in there. Let's take a quick look at one of those. So I think we'll take a look at this one, b-series.bin, and I've used the struct pack to write the data. We're not going to worry so much about writing. I just wanted to have some examples in there that write out the data so we're not downloading too much stuff. But if we open up the current directory, control X, control F, and a period. Now, I had it open before, so I'm going to hit a G here in dured mode to refresh. And we have a whole bunch of files. So hopefully you've got a range of files showing up in your directory. So control X, control F, and then period if it shows up in tilde slash class 21. So control X, control F, and then a period, and press enter. Hit G in there to make sure it's up to date. You can hit a bunch of times and whenever you feel like. And there is capital B dash series dot bin. Hit enter. It turns out when you write numbers in random binary data, it can sometimes look like strings. So I wrote a, a sequence of numbers. I'm going to show you one quick mode in Emacs that I don't expect you to understand what you see, but you'll at least have heard of this one too. So we're going to say meta x hexel dash mode, and I'm in the file b dash series dot bin, and it's going to switch to a binary viewing mode. You'll hit enter, and it's going to show you the hex characters on the left, and if you look at the right, there's a matching highlighted character over there. This is very confusing when you first see it and maybe the first 10 or 100 times you see it. So just sort of get a feel for it. If you um, do a control X2 to split your window and you type meta X man, M-A-N, and then press enter. And then we're gonna type ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, hit enter. And we've now brought up the Unix manual page for the ASCII character codes. And if we scroll down a little bit, we have octal decimal, which is our base 10, that's the normal way that you count, and hex numbers, and then what that character tends to mean, uh, written down here. And so you can look up, like if we have 73, if we want to look at 73 in terms of the hex number, we can scroll down until we hit 73, which is right here. Having not gone through this too carefully, I've shown how difficult it is to follow man pages of ASCII and match them up here. But as you work through it, oh, there we go. I think I see it right here. So this 73 right here, that character code should be an S, and we have a little S up there. Uh, they're just there to copy and paste for now. And if you come back later on, hopefully they'll make a little more sense by the end of class. That block of code was just to write some files. So sometimes I'll expect you to just copy and paste code. It'll do some stuff, and then we'll work through how it actually works slowly in the class. So this is a topic where there's a lot of things going on and it's sort of a chicken and the egg. And we could spend 
two months going through this and trying to get all the details, and then you might have a really good sense of it. But we're going to do the, I hope you get a gist of what's going on and you don't feel too overwhelmed. But if you're not getting everything that we're doing here, it's okay. So this is more the exposure mode of just having seen it at least once so that when you get to it and have to work on it, you're a little bit more familiar with the topic. The 73 you were looking at before was not, or was the wrong column, right? It's hard to know where the column is and remember, so I have to go back up to the top. I could be smarter. I could do control X2 in there and then this would have been the wise thing to do. So search 73 with the control S. So there it's in the decimal column and there it's in the hex column. That would, that would be a much better way of doing it. I'm in a mode where you say meta x hexel, H-E-X-L dash mode. And this is the programmer hacker mode of looking into data. Why don't you go ahead and quit Emacs? And we'll just get you quick started over. Yeah, let's get this figured out really quick. So open up Emacs and do control X, control F. Uh, just do control X one. So now do control X, control F, yep. And now type class slash 21, press enter. Okay, so now you're in there, you're in the right directory. So now you can hit enter on the 21 python binaryfiles.org. So click on that. So now you've got the org file open in the right place. I think you might have multiple copies running around. Yeah, so click on that one. And now you can do the hexel mode thing. So did you guys see that? I had open the man page and I split it with a control X2 that splits the window like we've done before. And then I scrolled part of it to where I could see the header with this octal decimal hex. And then I scrolled the bottom part or did a control S searching for the number I was looking for. Well, if you sp start spending time in this, it means that you're kind of desperate and you're struggling pretty hard with a format or you have some troubles. This is like the, I'm having a bad day. I need to run this and learn it. And at that point, you're probably gonna be reading the manuals and trying to learn it a little bit more on your own. But at least you've seen it it might come back in your memory that day that you're stuck sitting someplace with some data that you need to work on. All right, so I'm gonna go back to our org file. Let's go ahead and just jump right into that SBET file. Now we've, we've got those other files there and if you, you're feeling uncomfortable or you're feeling like maybe you've got it some more and you wanna try some different kinds of files, those files are now sitting in your virtual machine for you to play with down the road. And you can open them up in Emacs, you can run other commands on them and try them from within Python as you see fit. But let's go ahead and open up our sample sbet file. So if we say sbet, s-b-e-t underscore file equals open sample, and then I just did sa, press tab, and that will open our file. Doesn't know anything about it. Um, if you're on Windows, I always forget this, uh, but I remembered it just now. You can't just open a binary file on Windows. It seems to be kind of broken with reading files. So you have to, I think it's do a B as your mode. And so when, if you're on a Windows trying to do this, come ask me when you end up doing it and you open a file, it's not gonna work to open binary data directly on Windows. For some reason, they, they broke opening and reading files. But now what we can do is we can say sbet data equals sbet file.read. We're just gonna grab everything in that file because it's not too big, it's 22K, and we're gonna dump it into a variable and see what happens, see what we get. So if you hit enter, it's zipped all that data quickly into uh, a memory. Now, if you're reading a real SBET file that's say 700 megabytes, this read command might take you a few years. Later on, we'll talk about how to zoom through the file bit by bit. And now we can type whose to see what we've got in our space. And that looks pretty gross. We have like little weird question marks inside of a bubble and squares and zero zeros. It basically loads it into a raw string for us, but it's not really characters. So we're gonna have to work with it and use the struct command to try and interpret that as something useful. Now, if we say type of SBET data, should match up exactly with what we got up there, that it's an STR. We can say length of our SBET data and it should be the same length as our file. So we have 22,712 bytes in that data block. We're gonna jump right into this command called struct unpack that actually unpacks binary data. So I'm gonna to try to make a mistake first to show you what it looks like before we do it right. And you know, in the notes I have it just right. So we'll say struct.unpack. Remember you can get help with a question mark. 
this help isn't the most helpful. It says unpacked a string containing packed C structure data, which you don't know what that means, so that's less than helpful. Thanks, guys. So if we say unpack dash D for our double from that table that we had on the web, and then we pass it our sbet data. Now if we just pass it the whole giant block of data, it's looking for one double, and it found 22, so that would be eight bytes. It found 22,000 something or other bytes, and it said, I don't really like that. Take a hike. So what we need to do is slice off the first eight bytes, press enter, and we get back some number. It's kind of hard to tell if that number is right or wrong. So let's load up one of our data files that we've got, and we'll try the same thing with something that we know what it might be, ls. So we've got a few files to try. I've written this one here, d-series.bin, where I just wrote a series of numbers that are uh, stepping up. So what we can say is data file equals open d-series.bin and data equals data underscore file dot read length of data. So we've just got 80 bytes in there and we can say struct dot unpack d for a double and then we want to pass it in data and just those first eight bytes. And we get back the number 0.0. .0. I actually wrote 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in this file. So it's actually pretty nice that we actually can prove to ourselves, it's always good to start off with data that you know and read that before you go and try and read something where we don't know. Our first time number in this SBET file, I don't know, have any sense of what that number is going to be. So how do we know if we got it right or wrong? It could be kind of hard to understand. So that's given us at least a little proof that we can read some binary data. What we can do is if we've got multiple bytes or groups of things that we want to read, we can specify multiple letters in this string for the type of things we want to unpack. So we can say struct.unpack. And if we want to do two doubles, then we can say data colon. And then I'm going to do some math in here, 8 times 2, so 16. And hopefully this will pack the, unpack the first two numbers with two Ds. So now we've unpacked 0 and 1. We can also unpack all of them. So we can say dd, let's see, if we do 10 of them, there's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Hopefully I got the right number of them. And if you have 10 Ds, you can unpack all 10 numbers in one, one command here. But there's a nice shortcut because typing 10 Ds is really hard to do and error prone. You can write the number 10 saying, I want to unpack 10 of these double floating point numbers in there. So we press enter and we've unpacked all 10. So let's try those on our SBET. So back here, we can do struct unpack DD and we can take the second two numbers, which should be our latitude and longitude. If we look here, so this is the first eight and then we've got latitude and longitude. So we'll say struct unpack DD SBET data eight colon 24. So that's 16 bytes long. Press enter and we get back two numbers that are really hard to read. And the reason that's hard to read is that it's not in decimal degrees, it's in radians around the earth, which is a little hard to think about if you're not used to it and I am definitely not used to it. So instead of going from zero to 360 degrees, it goes from zero to two pi around the earth. You know, if you tell me how many radians we are from Greenwich Mean, uh, I have no idea. You know, we're, we're somewhere negative on our longitude and we're a little bit positive on our latitude, but I have no idea what that number between zero and pi is gonna be. So let's try unpacking those two, but we'll switch that. Instead of DD, we'll do 2D. So we've got two of them. So we've now got our two radian numbers that don't make a lot of sense yet. Or we can unpack the whole thing. So since this is 17 double numbers, We'll unpack the whole thing. So we'll just say, instead of 2D, we'll do 17D. And rather than slicing out two doubles worth, we're just gonna pass in all of that, except for, we'll have to do 17 times eight. So it's eight bytes per double, and we have 17 of them. Press enter. We now have all those fields from the first record. So we've gone in 
right here in the file, grab the first block of them, and we've unpacked all of those as numbers. Unfortunately, the units on all of these numbers are such that nothing in there is very intuitive. So we're gonna have to work a little bit to get towards that. So in the notes, yep, we have about the same thing. Pretty horrible. With Python, if you have two numbers, say x comma y, you can set them to minus one and 999. You can do assignments where with this, with commas in between, the first variable here is gonna get assigned to the first number, a comma, and then we've got y as our second variable, that'll get the second number. So what we can do is unpack is like what's over here on the right. And if we had 17 variable names on the left, we could then assign all these valuables into variable number names so that we can actually understand which one is which without having to, to count all the time. So let's go ahead and try that out. So first we'll just type x comma y so you can see it and say whose. And you should see x comma y getting set to minus one and 999. So let's try that with our 17 variable names. So this is gonna be a lot of typing, I'm sorry. So time, latitude, I'm just gonna call it lat and be lazy. Longe, altitude, and I'm just gonna start abbreviating because I don't wanna type out the whole names in the notes, that's no fun. Y velocity, Z velocity, roll, pitch, heading, wander, I wonder what wander is, X Excel, we call it EL for fun. Y, Excel, this is really miserable. Z, Excel, X, Ang, Y, Ang. This is where we get to make lots of typos and see how many of us are good at typing accurately, and I'll probably fail. Z, Ang equals struct, unpack, and since you already know about using the uh, the count here. If you want to type out 17 Ds, you're welcome to, but uh, I'm sure I'll make a mistake, so we'll just do 17 D since we already know that. And then comma, and then we'll pass in. It's gonna be, again, our data going from zero to the size of one block. So 17, we'll do data, 17 colon 17 times eight. We'll just copy that whole block. So we'll do edit copy. This is why doing it this way is really not fun. So if we hit paste, oh, you know what? Ah, yes, SBED data, thank you. Yeah, so I just had data and we have another data variable running around. If we hit enter, since I don't like that data being around because I'll do that again, I'm gonna delete data. And so at least it'll tell me that there's no data from now on. So now if we type who's, we should see too much junk to fit on one screen. So if we look through here, you'll see a lot of our variables by name and they've been stored into our workspace and you could then work with a particular packet that gets the job done. But better yet, what we can do, there's a trick that we can take, we can take two different lists, one a list of the field names, and then the other list is a list of values we wanna put in. And there's this weird thing called zip in Python. And I didn't know about zip for the first 15 years of programming in Python. And when I discovered zip, I kicked myself for not having discovered this before because it's really amazing. Zip will take two sequences and blend them together and then we can create a dictionary out of them. So if we say zip x, Here's our first list, x, y, and one, two. Sticks them together, not very exciting, but if we then add, hey, we wanna make this into a dictionary, this very weird syntax, which I didn't discover on my own, will take these two lists and turn them into a dictionary with, so here's our first list with x and y, and then our series of numbers. It'll make a dictionary this way that's x is set to y, so x is set to one and y is set to two. So it takes this one and matches it up with that and that matches up with that. So what we can do is build a list of our field names and we can pair that up with what comes back from struct, which is a list of all of our values. So that way, every time we do it, we can just call this quick command and take all of those field values and stuff it together with our actual values and end up with a dictionary 
that we have one item for our packet of SBET information. So let's give that a try. Since I don't feel like typing, I'm going to copy this block here. We'll define our field list. So copy, edit, paste. So if we type field names to see what we've got, we just have a list or tuple. They, they work the same of all of our names of our fields, how we want to call them. And then if we want to get our values, we can type values equals struct dot unpack. And we had 17 doubles, sbet underscore data, colon, and then eight times 17. And this should unpack those 17 values into this value variable. So if we type values, we have all those values that we don't currently know very well yet, but we'll, we'll start figuring them out in a minute. And now we can do this really weird dict, and then we can do a zip. And in that zip, we'll say field names, comma, values. And if I hit enter, I now have a dictionary by name that I can use for that. Or if we want to do a simpler example, we can cut out the first four of each one. So let's do that, colon four because that's pretty huge, colon four. So we're going to grab the first four of each of those, put them together, and we create a very small dictionary with our altitude, latitude, longitude, and time. So this feels pretty weird to me in terms of being a Python programmer. It doesn't, doesn't feel very natural, but I keep this in my little list of tricks that I use, and I sometimes have to look it up to remember how to do this. But this way, Every time we read one of these SBET structures of 17 values, we can put it in and use things by name because using things by number drives me crazy. If I have to remember what's in position 15, I'm never going to make it. Did we have to save that as some kind of variable to be able If you want to do anything else with it, yes. But so far, we're just playing around. Okay. So let's do exactly that. Let's save it into a variable. Okay. So I'm going to go back up to the one where we didn't have the slicing. And we'll say sbet values equals and hit enter. So now we've saved it into a variable. So we can say type sbet values, press enter, and we have a dictionary. So it's going to be a lot easier to deal with this dictionary by name. So we can start working with things like the latitude and longitude and see if it makes sense when we convert it from radians to degrees. So if we do Import math, I think that we did this before, but just to double check, import math. Math has, why don't I do a history and then you can see real quick that and then I'll highlight the commands that we need to run. So history. So what we've done is we did the field names equals, we, we copied that right out of the notes. So if you have, hopefully you have field names and I would just copy and paste this out of the notes if you can. And then what we did is we said, values, struct, unpack, and then we give it 17D, our SBET data, and we gave it the first 17 doubles. And then we save this variable SBET values equals dict zip field names values. So now what we're going to do, since these guys are in radians, and if any of you can think in radians, I'm impressed, but we're going to switch it to degrees because I think most of us are much more comfortable with degrees around the earth. There's a nice function inside of math that just you say math.degrees, it will take radians and convert it back for us. And what we can then do is math.deg tab and a question mark. And you guys can read about math.degrees. Convert angle x from radians to degrees. This one actually makes more sense than most of the help. So we can say math.degrees. Then we can say our sbet values. And then we can say, so it's latitude, longitude. We can say longitude. We did initially, but then when we copied and pasted right up here, you'll see that longitude is written out longitude. It's, it's one of those weird things. Is it easier or better to write L-O-N-G or L-O-N than longitude? And if you're typing it out all the time, you'll go crazy with writing out longitude. But if you're trying to read code in the long run, longitude's a little bit easier because long and lat tend to get a little bit harder to notice the difference. So hit enter and we're at minus 146.67. So we're on the western side of the United States someplace. 
So what we can do then is we can add that back into the dictionary so we can then improve what we've got. So we've got the raw dictionary that we built from one of these messages in the SBET file, so one record, and we can then interpret those, convert them into something that makes more sense to us, and stuff them into that dictionary alongside of what we had. So here, we can take the latitude, that math.degrees we just did, and the longitude, and we can calculate those and stick them inside of that dictionary. So we can say SBET values, we say long degrees equals math.degrees, SBET values longitude. And we'll do the same thing for latitude. I'm going to go replace latitude, lat degrees, hit enter. With those two commands, we've now stored in that dictionary more readable values. So go ahead and print out your SBET values. So just type SBET underscore values, press enter. And we we're starting to have a lot of things, so it's hard to find the ones we want. But if we look here, lat degrees, 60 degrees north. That implies that we're up kind of in the Alaska area somewhere. So then if we look at the launch degrees, we're at minus 146.7. So we're definitely over in Alaska. So this is working towards reading one packet that came, came back from our uh, inertial navigation system. What we can do then is work on building a system where we're going to go through and read multiple different versions. So we can basically take the data out of this block, parse it, get back our dictionary, go to the next one, read this one, parse it, do something with it. And in the end, what we're trying to do with this series is we'd like to be able to make a KML map of where the ship was going during this particular data file. So we just want to have a cruise track from the SBAT that says, where do we go within Alaska? And what we need to start doing is creating basically an SBET module for ourselves that will understand how to decode each of those packets. So we're going to take this stuff that we've just done, try to turn it into a file that we can reuse as you go along. So for some of you, this is actually going to be practical stuff if you go back out on ships, if you deal with an Aplanix pause pack kind of setup, you'll actually have these files coming out of your multi-beam system and you can then do something like decimate this, turn it into a little cruise track, and if someone dumps you a whole bunch of these files, you can start building a processing system out of this kind of setup. So let's go ahead and start into that. So I'm going to split the screen with Control X2 and I'm going to open up a file so if you're having trouble catching up to where we are now, everything that we've done so far, you don't have to worry about. You can just let it go for now and come back to it through the notes and take your time. So I'm going to open up Control X, Control F, sbet.py, and it's blank. We got blank canvas. We got to start with something. Let's start writing a comment first. Decode a Planix pause pack sbet IMU binary files. There's nothing like in most of our lives when we're working out at sea, a lot happens. And so it's really good to start off with documentation because you get 10 minutes into something and something critical happens and you have to run off and work on it. So documentation from the beginning is good. And let's create a function called decode. And right now, we're going to do nothing other than print hello from decode. This is the most boring of functions that does absolutely nothing. Save it. And we're just going to remember how to load a module and call a function from within our module. Because we've seen it before in this class, but it really doesn't hurt to do it a few times to get more comfortable with it. So if we do an ls over here, we should see hiding somewhere in here. Oh, there it is. sbet.py. And we can do import sbet. Press enter. Hopefully it just works. If you've got a typographic error, you might get uh, some sort of error. So take a peek at that and see if you've got common problems are, I use double quotes here. You have to have double quotes on both sides or do single quotes on both sides. Remember in Python, single quotes and double quotes work the same. You just have to have the same type on either side. And then we can say sbet dot press tab. And we'll see that we have a decode hiding down here. So we can do sbet decode two parentheses, and I'm going to scoot this back up for the folks in the back. Hit enter, and it says hello from decode. That's not very exciting, but we have a function that we can start building up to handle processing one of these messages. So let's start improving that. So here's the block we just did with our import. 
And we're going to start improving this. If we want to update it, say print 7 times 6, a very important number. We have to, instead of just saying import sbet, if we did import sbet and we ran decode again, we don't get our update. We actually have to reload sbet, press enter. And now if we run decode, you should see hello from decode and the number 42. If you didn't see that after the reload, you might not have saved. Remember that you have to have no stars in here so that it tells you that the file's actually been saved to disk. So we don't have a decode that does very much, so we need to start working towards that. In the section, getting ready to parse sbets, let's create a main function that will open up our sample sbet file, read in the data, and get ready to call our decode. So let's create a new function with a def, and then main. So then two parentheses and a colon. Hit enter, it does the right indenting for us. And like I've done before, at the beginning and end of functions, it's often good to just have a print starting in the function name and, and then finishing or ending that function name so that as you run the code, you see each of your functions getting called. It's, it becomes pretty obvious. So we'll say starting main, print, finishing main. And in between, so we'll just take it from our notes. So we'll add those two in. So we'll say sbet file equals open sample.sbet. And we'll load our data with sbet data equals sbet file.read, left parenthesis, right parenthesis. Save that. And I'm a big fan of writing a little bit of code, seeing if you can run it, writing a little more code, seeing if you can run it. Some people are able to write the whole thing first and then start debugging that, and I definitely don't do well in that environment. But if you can pull that off, feel free to go for it. So we're going to do our reload again. Reload, and then sbet. Now we can say sbet period hit tab. And now we have our decode function and our main function. So let's call the main, press enter. And you see our starting main, finishing main, and nothing really happened. But we're getting closer. So let's see if we can add, bless you, a function that will actually pass that data into decode. Then we'll start doing something in that decode. So let's go ahead and call decode. But actually before that, we'll check what we've read. That would be wise. So print read this many bytes. So what we can do is get the length of our SBET data and make sure that it's actually read. If this comes back zero, we might have opened some other file. Or if it gets really large, you know, we know that we haven't opened the right thing. So SBET data. That'll print out the number of bytes we've read. And then we'll call decode. And we'll pass in decode our SBET data. Now if we do it right now, our decode function doesn't take any arguments. So it should be upset with us. So save it with control X, control S. We'll do a reload. And then we'll rerun our main. And it should be very unhappy. Decode takes no arguments, and we gave it one argument. So we're now having an argument with decode. And we get to enjoy the English language, which is very ambiguous sometimes. We need to improve our decode function. So we've got up here. Uh, our improved decode in the notes. So let's get towards that. And the first thing I'll do is I'll write in some help. So we'll say decipher a sbet datagram from binary. So that's our doc string. When we ask for help from decode, that's what's going to get printed. And we're going to add in here data. So we'll take some variable called data. And now let's use that. We'll say print data length, colon, and the quote, comma, and then length data. Let's save that. And so what should happen now is when we run main, we'll call this decode. With our sbet data, it goes into this decode function, and it should print out the same number of bytes here that are up in our read this many bytes. So let's give that a shot. So let's do a reload and rerun, and hopefully, you should see a 22712 from the main, and our data length is 22712 from inside of our function. 
if you guys, I'll stick around. If you guys have any troubles with this because we covered a lot of stuff, feel free to ask me questions and feel free to take a look at the ginormous document if you've got lots of free time or having trouble sleeping. You can then read up on the, the python binaryfiles.org file, which goes into very much of this in much greater detail. For example, there's two pages before you get to the definition table of what is an SBET. So it, it definitely talks a lot more about what's going on, gives you much more detail. Typically before people teach how to do this stuff, they have whole classes on bits and bytes and computer organization and architecture. We've skipped all that and we've said, we'll just go for it and hope you guys get a feel for it down the road. So do expect to be a little bit confused with the number of bytes and whatnot. And we'll get into that slowly but surely. And by seeing some examples first, when you read about it, you'll actually understand and learn it much faster, I think. But right now you'll feel a little bit confused. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I broke okay, my own yeah, convention. Yeah. I'm sorry about oh, that. I had, okay. I, I try not to use double quotes ever. They're just more noise. Yep. So if you take a look up there, so that, that's right. That's what we did first. So this is totally good. Now, if you look up there, see how I've added stuff to my decode function? Now you need to, to go up to your decode function and edit your decode function and add. See how we now pass in data into decode? So we started off, we added this new function with decode sbet data. And then we had to go improve this guy to handle that. So we added data right in here as an argument, which is our first step. I added a doc string, not that important, but that's what I, I did make that change. And then I added a print data length and then the length of the data, which isn't very, we're not doing anything very exciting, but it should print out the same thing here and here. Global name SPET data not defined. Okay, so let's see. Um, Line 14, okay, so go over here and let's go to line 14. So right here, take a look at your code here and read this line to me. Read that out loud. What does it say? So it says sbet underscore file equals open sample. Sbet. And now what does it say here? sbet underscore file equals sbet underscore file read. And take a look at mine there. It says sbet file equals, and then the next line it says sbet data. Yeah. It's definitely worthwhile to read it out loud on both cases. And sometimes when you read it, you'll, you'll catch that mistake. You know, there's lots of tricks, like you're typing in lots of text. And so everybody develops their own methods for how to be more accurate. And I like reading it out loud. It doesn't always work for everybody, but sometimes reading it up on the screen and reading it on your screen you know, between the two, you'll spot that little quirk or whatever you mistyped. We've had a lot of those like single quotes versus double quotes mm -hmm. and little stuff where it's hard to, like you saw me, I typed data and I should have been typing SBET data. And trying to catch those things is hard. So take a look, read the first line of my decode, at the definition line, and then read yours. So in the Emacs window, the top little pane there, it says def decode. Read that whole line out loud. You don't have data, so it's a function call. So the, the name data is local to the function. So here, you're going to pass in SBET data right there. Uh -huh. And then in here, it's going to call that same thing data. Is that confusing yep. with the functions? So yep. when you have a function, it, whatever argument it has, it names it whatever it wants, and it's going to refer to it by its own local name. So after I run this, this is going to, SBET data is going to be called data? Or only, only, within, only that within that function? Only within that function, yeah. And that's what's sometimes confusing. Like you could call that like foo and foo and it would work. It's locally whatever you want to call well, so it. If I Understanding how a function works where you can pass in whatever name you want. So you could call decode. Yeah, so what we're gonna do in the next lecture is we're gonna actually load up a file. We're gonna get rid of this hard coded file name here. So that it's a variable name? Yes. Yeah. That's and then we'll make it a command line and we'll even make it if we get time, we'll make it so that we can load up and we can read through n files. So I can I can probably make yeah. another one. And then if I do that, then we can see reading like three or four SBETs, and then uh, which just means I need some more examples. But then then we can read through them and make the sh the cruise track for each one separately, all in one one go. So it's just like I think we've covered functions so fast that people are uncomfortable with functions right now. So that's why I wanted to show another one and have people work with it a little bit more. So this is good. So argument passing is, is a little bit tricky in terms of, of a concept.